So having said that, look at Luke chapter 17, verse 20, 21. Here's the Pharisees asking Jesus an important question. When he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Old King James says the kingdom of God is in your midst. So when the Pharisees come to Jesus and say, where is the kingdom? What's it look like? When is the kingdom? What does Jesus say? It doesn't come by observation. What's observation? We know that Jesus means it doesn't come by looking at it. How do we know that? Well, because look at the qualifiers. Nor are they going to say, see here, or see there. See the, the word see? Because I've, I've heard this interpreted that what this means is that the kingdom of God doesn't come by the observances of the Mosaic law, that you can't do the observances and get the kingdom. I don't disagree with that phrase. The kingdom doesn't come by observing Moses' law. But that's not what Jesus meant because the context, Jesus said they're going to say, see here, see there. So what's observance mean? Something you can see. So when the Pharisees want to know about the kingdom, Jesus says, you're not going to be able to see it, guys. It's invisible. This is the invisible kingdom verse. This is where Jesus identifies that the kingdom is invisible or this, or I like to say the invisible nature of the kingdom. It isn't observed, rather it is lived out. From where? From within, from in your midst. The men in Jesus' day, I say that genderless, mankind in general, struggled with this point in Jesus' day and they struggle with it in our own day. What's the point they struggle with? People have struggled with the invisible nature of the kingdom. A lot of Christians to this day struggle with kingdom sermons and the, kingdom, the nature of the kingdom because they keep believing that the kingdom is to come only. The kingdom is over there. The kingdom's where you go when you die. And we get confused by stuff like kingdom of heaven versus kingdom of God. You know, there's whole teachings on the kingdom of God's one thing. You get it. Kingdom of heaven, that's where you go when you die. It's, it's, it's a literary usage, okay? What I mean by that is Matthew uses kingdom of heaven, only Matthew. But Matthew doesn't use kingdom of God because Matthew's writing to Jews. And the Jews have an affinity. A, that's the wrong word. They have a, a almost built-in offense at the usage of the word God in print. And so Matthew substitutes it with kingdom of heaven because his book's written to Israel. And so let's not think we some big cosmic fight between there's a place, there's a kingdom of heaven and a kingdom of God. We're talking about the same concept. We still struggle with the invisible nature of it, um, thinking that it's something that can be observed. Look at this next one, Luke 19, 11. We've moved up two chapters. As they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem, because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Two chapters ago, they said, what's kingdom? And Jesus goes, you can't, you're not going to be able to see it. It's, it's in your midst. It's in the middle. Two chapters later, they go, oh, this is it. This is when the kingdom of God's going to appear. What did they not get two chapters ago? He said, the kingdom will not come with observation. Two chapters later, the king, is this when the kingdom's going to appear? Is it going to appear immediately? They struggled with it. Two chapters after telling them the kingdom isn't observed and that it's in their midst, they still look for an observable kingdom. So people... If they did it two chapters after Jesus, are they going to do it 2,000 years after Jesus? Come on. He's in there. He's standing there going, you're not going to be able to see it. And it's going to come from inside of you. Two chapters later, is this when we get to see the kingdom? You go, I mean, you kind of, at times you think Jesus probably just walked off. Just, I just need a break. I, I don't know how much more I can say that you can't see it and it's going to be inside of you. And yet all of you think that you can see it and it's going to be this big thing on the app. He get, he's way more patient than me. I mean, I would have just been throwing stuff in the air. <laughs> um, so they still look for an observable kingdom. We have a hard time seeing God's kingdom as a system of governing ourselves. So Jesus then goes on to tell the story. And I didn't want to read all of the text because I thought I'd stay there too long. But the next story Jesus tells is a nobleman who received the kingdom but is hated by his own subjects. So he blessed them. And then judgment fell on those who did nothing with what they are given. Thus Israel faced as much. It's the story of the men who, in the book of Luke, the, the, the story of the minnows, not minnows as in little fish, but the little amounts of money in Israel. Uh, 
And Jesus tells a story of a, of a, a man who inherits a kingdom. He comes back, his subjects don't like him. So he hands out gifts and he goes away and he says, I'm going to come back. And when he comes back, he asks what you've done with it. It's a very similar story to the Matthew 25 parable of the talents. Very similar. The context is a little different the way Luke tells it. And, and you've got the guy who went and doubled it and another guy that went and made more money. And then the third guy's like, well, I knew you were a rough guy. I didn't do anything with it. And Jesus tells the story of how he's in trouble because he did nothing with it. What in the world does that story mean? And that's caused people to go, boy, you better use your talent for the Lord. Or if you don't, he's going to take it from you or you're going to suffer. I used to hear people manipulate when I come up in church. This is embarrassing. When I come up in church, I heard people use stuff like that. Man, pastors prayed on people being ignorant. Because I remember people get up lead service and go, so-and-so, Natasha, you got a song? And you go, no, I don't want to sing. Well, and then somebody goes, well, you got talent for the Lord. If you don't use that talent, you're going to lose it. And they were quoting that scripture. Like, so what Jesus does is if you have something and you don't use it, he just take it from you. And the, the, the point Jesus is making is, listen, Israel, your king's here. You got a chance. You going to do something with it? If you're not, the chance is over with. This is it. This is the final generation. This is the terminal generation. On my way to the cross, I'll stop and cry over you. In fact, you remember this? Passion Week, Jesus is dragging his cross down the street and a group of women are crying on the side of the road. And Jesus turns to the women and says, don't weep for me, weep for your kids. <laughs> like, wow, what, what's that mean? It's Jesus saying, I've given you one final chance to receive and you don't receive I'm here to do what I'm here to do. So why does Jesus tell that story on the heels of them thinking the kingdom's coming immediately? It was Jesus once again saying, it's right here. It's in your midst. You're holding it. What are you doing with it? And I'm, my fear, and I don't mean fear as in I'm petrified and shaken over this, but I, you know, a certain sort of godly awe at having come into an understanding that we have something. We have something powerful and vital. And my fear is... To stand in front of the Father and, and Him say, you didn't do anything. I lived inside of you for 60 years and did you, you didn't tell anybody. You didn't, you didn't love your neighbor. You didn't, I, don't, I know He's not playing some big movie in heaven and a big moment of me getting condemned. I'm just making a point of, because I heard that junk too. Like, you're going to stand before God and He's going to show you all the stuff you did wrong. And then in the same breath, they'd go, God's throwing your sins in the sea of His forgetfulness. And I would think, how are they in His forgetfulness and in His DVD player? Like, He's got them there in heaven, but I, I don't think about it unless you give me a problem and then we'll play them. So that's not, I don't, I don't mean, I, I, I'm just referencing the idea that I think we have such an amazing power, such an amazing mystery that is in us that is Christ. And we can't shirk the responsibility of what that looks like. And it's so much like Jesus saying, what did you do with the, the talents I gave you? Did, you? did you just put them away because you were scared? Because you just wanted to get, maybe you, know, maybe you just wanted to get out of here. And you didn't feel like this was yours. You didn't do anything with it. And I think the point was you should have been doing something with it. I put you here to be a difference maker, to help the people that can't help themselves, to love the people that don't know me. To sp Why are we doing spreading the gospel? What's the gospel supposed to be? Why am I supposed to be telling you about the gospel? Why should I care about you? You go, well, because he's going to burn in hell. So then I don't see the early church doing that. I don't see them going hitting the streets because they're afraid people are going to burn in hell. They want to make a proclamation. It doesn't have to be this way for you now. Not just it doesn't have to be this way for you in 10,000 years. It doesn't have to be this way for you now. You can have the life of God on the earth. The king's come. The king has come and his kingdom is here. You don't have to be the way you are. You don't have to re react the way you react. You can live the life of God on the earth. What's that look like? Let me tell you about him. His name is Jesus and this is what it looks like. You want to see it in practical terms? This is what it sounds like. 
It's not about copycatting the motions and actions of Jesus, but releasing people into the understanding that there's a resurrected man on the earth. You can be a part of that reality. And so I think that's what Jesus is saying when they go, is, this, is the kingdom observable now? And he goes, gosh, why are you missing this? No, it's not what you can see. It's a gift you have inside. And are you doing anything with it? Are you just burying it in the sand? Or are you letting it come out?